Well, let's get started again. Um, Zoe's going to come back soon, but um, we'll just get started so that we have time to finish on time. Um, or finish, because we're finishing on time regardless. Um, so, okay. So, organizational activity. Um, is it going? Okay. So, organizational activity, as I mentioned before, is a measure of sort of perceptual synthesis. It's um, a sort of empirically derived score that um, sort of measures how the person is able to like, take things from, from the blot in different ways and combine it in their head. So it goes to, again, that first part of the pro response process that I talked about at the beginning. Um, so there's, um, oh, I wish I had um, the table. So there, there are tables, and you probably don't have to really know um, the specific values, because they change based on what blood you're looking at. So every card has four different possible z-values, or z-scores. Um, you, not all responses have z-scores, but um, there are four different types, right? There's a whole response. So every time there's a whole response, you give a z-score for the whole response. So that's uh, zw or just w. Um, and they range from 1.0 to 5.5, depending on what blot. Uh, for instance, for card 5, where it's just the most basic response is a whole, like a, a bat, then eh, you still use a z-score, but it's not as uh, it's not as hard to see that response as a whole res as a whole blood response than say card ten, which has a bunch of random little things. So if they're able to give a whole response for that, it's like wow, it really took a lot more mental effort. Um, Z A and Z D are Z scores that are given for uh, adjacent areas or distant areas. So are they combining two parts of the blot that are close together, sort of like touching? If they're touching, then it's Z A. And ZA goes from 1.0, for instance, to um, 4.0. Those are the range of values depending on the blot. So if usually, in order to give ZA and ZD, you're going to also have um, a determinant quality of plus, so a synthesized response. Because how can you be talking about two different parts? Um, if you're only having an ordinary one element response. Right? So if you're, it's like, it's a shoe, well, that can't be synthesized. You can't be combining parts of the blot um, in that way. So like, think about it that way. Like, if you're doing Z, A, or Z, D, like, chances are it's going to be a plus uh, determinant, uh, the developmental quality of plus, because you need two objects. The only difference between uh, adjacent and distant is whether or not the parts are touching or they're distant. Usually, when they're distant, it requires more mental energy to put things together. So those values tend to be higher, and they range from 3.0 to 6.0. Like, uh, for instance, in card one, uh, if they use a distant area, then you, um, that's like the highest thing you can give. And so what was it, 1.0 to 6.0? For distant, it's 3.0 to 6.0. And you don't really have to know the, the values, because um, that would be like cruel and unusual. Um, also, when you do the scoring on the computer, all you have to do is choose one of these. Um, white space. So every time there is white space, um, generally when there's white space, that requires a different level of perceptual integration. And so you would do Z, CS. And then what happens, for example, when you are talking about um, a whole card response in which they incorporate white space. Whenever there's uh, two, um, two different organizational uh, z-scores possible, you give the highest one. Also, whenever you have vague responses, regardless of what they are, you never give an organizational um, z-score. So like two collides coming together, mm, that's vague. You don't give a response because it requires, it's a measure of mental em a measure of mental energy that requ require to put things together. Um, yay, special scores. And this is the last thing that we'll, we'll talk about um, briefly so we can go into interpretation. Um, special scores indicate unusual responses or cognitive slippage, things that will leave you thinking, oh? Huh? That's, uh, that's sort of like, I tend to um, look for special scores more carefully whenever I have a response that's like, that I'm like, what? That sounds weird. 
Um, did you have a question? Or? Oh. Um, and uh, some of them can be a little confusing, but um, in general, there are different types. There's unusual verbalizations, that has, and that has less to do with um, what they see and more about how they say it, uh, how they say it right? And uh, some of them are just, like content, for instance, it's just content. Um, and then there's um, some of them that are like one and two, um, where I might, we might give an example, but really go into the workbook to see the difference. Really, it's a subjective look at the examples, but usually one and two it is based on level of bizarreness. Mm -hmm. So something that's like, ah, OK, like still unusual, but not too bad, will be DV1. Or like, we'll have a one versus something that's like, whoa, this is really, really weird, will be a two. Um, so verbalizations. There's deviant verbalizations, which it'll be DV. And there are two types. Neologism, which means that word does not exist. Um, if they use a word that does not exist, um, like squish, squish, swoosh. Um, also redundancy. When they say things that, um, like a pair of two. Well, like an example of a DV1 redundancy is, oh, a tiny little puppy. Tiny little meaning the same thing. Whereas a DV2 that they list in the book is two twin lips of a vagina. Um, which sounds much more bizarre than a tiny little. So to a certain extent, it's it's really like a judgment call. Yeah. And like Mauricio was saying, it's how bizarre what they're saying sounds in terms of if you think it's a one or a two. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, redundancy, are, and these are things that have to do with the way they speak. Mm -hmm. um, DR, deviant responses, are also part of unusual verbalizations, but that doesn't have to do with language, but rather with sort of like the um, like know, appropriateness, of inappropriate phrases, for instance, are deviant responses. An example of an inappropriate phrase would be? Um, oh, it could be a pumpkin, but I guess pumpkins are out of season. So like that's inappropriate. It has nothing to do with the response, and it's just like what? Who cares? You still see a pumpkin. Um, another one is circumstantial responses. Uh, for example, me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've heard an example. Uh, maybe two snakes. I always hated snakes. My brother used to tease me about it. Something awful. So they're going outside of the cart. They're taking something and just going with it. So um, again, those can be one or two. The next level is inappropriate combinations. Things that they put, they're putting together and uh, shouldn't be put together. Um, again, a lot of times if they identify it as being a cartoon, you don't score special uh, score because cartoons, you can do anything. Um, but incon is incongruous combination. Two things that shouldn't be together. So, for example. Uh, so, an income one is a woman with the head of a bird. Um, whereas, an income two is, oh look, there's the bat, here's its ears, and there's its hands. Now, can, can you guys kind of see the difference in that it has anatomical features that are somewhat similar to hands. So, it's, while it's incongruous, it's not as extreme as pairing the head of one thing with the body of another. Does that make sense? Yeah. Next one is Fabcom. That's a fabulous combination. This is more of the type of stuff that you're like, okay, I could see this in a cartoon. Like, um, that's a chicken hold playing basketball. Mm -hmm. you're like, that's no way, but in reality, this could happen. Yeah. So it's fabulized. It's sort of weird. Um, Contam is sort of the worst. Those are the, like, and as we'll see in the, the scoring, there are, um, each of these is assigned a score of how weird it is. Contam is sort of like, it trumps that. When you have contam, you give no other special scores um, because con by contamination, it means you're blending responses in a way that makes no sense. Like, for instance. Oh. I was just going to point out, sometimes you can get a bit confused between what an income and a fabcom is. An important thing to note with the fabcom is that it's a relationship. Mm. It's, 
things in relationship with one another. Whereas an income is like within one thing, mm. right? So a woman with the head of a chicken is an income because it's it's one object. Whereas a fad calm, two chickens playing basketball is a relationship that's occurring. Does that make sense? So if you have any an question on the comps, it's like, well, is this a fad calm or an income? Look to see if there's the presence of a relationship and that will let you know, okay? And if you're having to debate between two different possible um, answers in the comps, knowing the special scores really well will help a lot mm -hmm. because that's another way that um, you can just say, well, that's not really a Fabcom, and then like you can eliminate that. And Contam is a, the just contamination. So you're giving two responses that the idea is like they're perceiving two different things and they can't make up their mind. They can't give a single response and so they're blending them together. A butterfly. Yeah. Um, the next one is inappropriate logic. So they're giving uh, an example of something that is sort of inappropriate. Like, oh, it's a baby. Well, why is it a baby? Because it's small on the page. You're like, well, that doesn't mean it's a baby. It could just be a small man or a, somebody seen from far away. Okay. Um, other special scores that will breeze through. Um, Perseverations are actually kind of, I find them a little bit hard to score because uh, I tend to want to give special scores all the time. So there are three different types. So three, you would call a perseveration three different ways. Within card perseveration is when you give very similar responses to the same card. So um, there's a technical definition where like... Um, I have it. They tend to have the same like comments yeah. and form quality. Within card perseveration, our responses are consecutive answers in which the same location, same developmental quality, same determinants like Kim was talking about, same form quality, content, and same z-score are given. Okay? Um, so that you don't just, you would code based on your coding of two different responses, so you'll see that, oh, they have the same quality, so they must be a perseveration. It doesn't have to be the same animal necessarily. If you give a bat and a butterfly for card um, one, the second one is going to be a perseveration. Mm -hmm. um, content perseveration is when it's uh, like when in different cards you identify an object that you saw in a different card. Oh, there are those two basketball playing chickens again. And so it's, it's not that it's the same thing. They have to identify it as the same one they saw before. Yeah. So if they give a bat for one and a bat for five, that's not perseveration. Unless they say, oh, it's the same bat. Um, and then it's mechanical perseveration, which is um, very, very, very rare. It's where you give the same answer in a mechanical way for every card. Mm -hmm. So, oh, it's a bat. Card two, oh, it's a bat. Card three, oh, it's a bat. And that's usually a sign of neuro, like severe neurologic damage, and you don't want to do a Rorschach for that person. <laughs> um, so other special scores. Um, <laughs> AB, that's abstract content. You're usually uh, giving that in, in conjunction with human experience. And um, I tend to want to give that one more than I should, so uh, look more carefully when you're studying and when it's appropriate. Um, you, it's um, usually abstract, abstract uh, content is given when they say something like, oh, it's a statue that represents love. So every time you hear something of represents, represents or symbolizes, mm -hmm. or um, so it's not necessarily that, you know, um, you know, it's a happy panda or a sad panda. Like, um, it's like when something represents something else. Um, or when they're clearly, clearly um, identifying affect. So a sad panda would also be abstract content. Um, AG is aggression, so whenever things are fighting, arguing, It has to be happening in the present. It has to be in present context for it to be given an aggressive. Oh, right. So if somebody, so if two people had a fight and one of them is dead, that's not aggression. That's not aggression. Because um, it's past tense. Best. Same way, cooperative movement, co cooperative. 
Well, it's cooperation is when two different things are in happy, nice relationships with each other. They're in love, they're holding hands, they're dancing. It has to be clearly positive yeah. in order to be coded as cooperative. Mm -hmm. um, morbid, that's another one that's a little confusing because some responses are morbid and they're not scored as morbid. So morbid is to identify something that is clearly dead or decayed. So um, a dead animal would be, but um, like two people fighting would not. Or even like, a, oh, it's a pool of blood would not be morbid, even if it is morbid. Mm -hmm. They have to identify an object that is dead or decaying. Or broken. Or broken. So a puppy with a limp leg, oh, uh, that would still be morbid. But yet um, a pool of blood because somebody got shot and now they're... Um, but they're not in the picture, so it's just a pool of blood because somebody got shot in the head and then stabbed 30 times, would not be morbid. Although, I mean. The book also says that you can code morbid for the attribution of a clearly dysphoric feeling. So something's gloomy, something's sad, something's depressed, right? It's also coded as morbid. Yeah. Forget about this, but can you have something score for morbid and aggression? Um. Yeah, I think there's no reason that you couldn't have both. Um, good human response, poor human response. Um, those are also, like, they're really nice. But uh, there's actually a very clear, cut out, like, way to do this in the book. We're not going to go over it for time. Um, in general, the computer does it for you because it, it's, not about, it's not a judgment call. It's like, if it has... Aggression, it's a poor human response. If it's a human detail, but n not this, then it's going to be something else. So um, look over that. PR is personalization. It's when people um, talk about their own experience. Oh, I had a cat like that when I was younger. Um, um, if you had read the book, you would know that um, you know this is something else. Um, so something that attributes their, like clearly states their own experience. And Exner states that when people use personalized elements in their responses, that it's a key sign of being defensive. <laughs> and CP, I've never seen it. I kind of wish I had. It's color projection. It's like... I've never seen it either. No. It's when they identify a color that isn't there. So um, for card one, if they say, oh, it's a pink butterfly. Huh. That, that would be color projection. <laughs> uh, those would be very clear. It's like they identify a color. I don't see it. I tend to have OK vision. Mm, that's CP. Um, these are just some rules um, for coding. All of these are independent of each other. So it doesn't matter what you have. You code them independently. So yeah, you could have aggression and morbid and poor human response, and a perseveration, and a personalization, and a color projection of the same response. Um, weird, but you could. These um, are, like if you use content, you can't use any of these. So DV, DR, Income, Fabcom, or Alog. Because content is just like, oh, there's something wrong, so why are you doing other things? Yeah? So you can have a JHR and PHR in the same? But they're independent of each other, so you could have a GHR and um, cooperation. A lot of times, like they'd be mutually exclusive because of the way you would code them. But in theory, they're independent of each other. So it's not like if you have one, you wouldn't have the other. Like for instance, you could never have morbid and a good human response in the same response, because by definition, if you look through the list, if you have morbid, you automatically give a poor human response. Mm -hmm. But you know, in theory, like. You could have any of them. Um, so um, here, there's a judgment call. If you don't, ha if you have content, you just give content. Ignore all the others. If there's more, like oftentimes you'll make a judgment call in terms of like, does is the response sort of like, am I gi I'm not going to give DV and DR for like the same phrase that is inappropriate because then you're sort of doubly adding on the badness to the person. So you'll choose the one with a higher score. And um, they're weighted differently. So like DV1 
it has a weighted score of one. So when you add up the weighted average in the um, structural summary, you'll, you'll weight, like, weight as like number of DD responses times one, number of DD2s times two. Having the weights for them um, not only allows you to be able to score them, but it gives you an idea of like, wow, contam, that's weighted seven. That, that's pretty bad. Equally to a fatcom two. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, in terms of the, their measures of cognitive slippage, um, but some are worse than others. Do you want to know what is the scores of the weights for the test? No, but I would know that contam and fatcom two are the worst. Yeah. And I, I would kind of like have a general trend of what's more acceptable, being like a DV1, DV2, and an INCOM1. Somewhat mild. They're, they, they can be potentially common mistakes. Fabcom2, CONTAM, not common. Like really significant. So, right. I mean, I don't think that you're going to be required to calculate elements of a structural summary. I don't think. Yeah, probably not. So, oh. I wouldn't put a lot of emphasis on memorizing it versus other things, but I would be aware <laughs> of the of the range. Okay, so now we're done with coding, and we're going into the structural summary and interpretation. So the structural summary is sort of a translation of all of the responses into the coded variables, and there are two parts. The upper section is just a tally of the different codes, and there's a lower portion which is like ratios. Mm -hmm. So here's a structural summary. You, you all have done it before. So this is the upper part where you just say like number of quack, number of FM, number of small m. And you just count it up. And then this is really the meaty part of the interpretation. So um, generally you want to do the top part first because then you can like put everything else away and just calculate the ratios, percentages, and derivations and this is what you'll use to um, interpret. So um, we'll go over each of the different portions of this and give um, sort of a brief idea of <coughs> what they mean. And so that's, um, that's sort of I think what we're left to do today. So um, if you, well, I guess if you were to have one, it'd be useful for you to um, sort of know where it is, because we're going to be splitting these up. Um, general, this is, here is the core section. This is the, yeah, you know these. Um, this is the affect section. This is the interpersonal section. This is a self, um, self perception. Self -perception. Information processing. Is this is information processing? Yeah. This is mediation. And, and then that's ideation. And that's ideation. And they each represent different things. Usually they're given as like different blocks. So we'll we'll talk about each block separately. Ready? Ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Anyone else ready? Okay. And oh, sorry. Okay. And if you don't already have it. Uploaded on Moodle is kind of not every part of the core section of the um, structural summary is kind of explained, but key parts of it are all laid all laid out for you with me listing normal ranges and what things mean under my name. Yeah. So I don't want to sound nasty, but just memorize it. <laughs> That's really kind of what you have to do. So let's start with R, okay? Responses. Now, like we said before, you need 14 responses to have a valid profile in order to be able to interpret the Rorschach. What is a normal range of responses? You're looking at 17 to 27 for adults, okay? So if you have less than 14, you can't interpret. But we're really looking at kind of like what a low R versus a high R looks like, okay? So when you have a low R, you usually have someone who's defensive, possibly depressed, resistant to testing, okay? Suspicious, distrustful, and perhaps overly guarded. Versus having a high R, which is usually indicative of a higher IQ, creativity, ability to tolerate stress, but it can also be indicative of a manic episode, okay? 
it's really important or additionally of obsessive compulsive tendencies. So it's really important always to look at these in the context of a clinical of clinical history and clinical presentation in order to piece out what a high R versus a low R really means. Okay? Then we have L, lambda. Lambda is the amount of energy that the person is putting into completing the test, okay? to their responses and basically a measure of their willingness to participate. So a high L is classified as greater than 0.99. Okay? And then lambda stands is the number of um, pure form responses to all the other responses. Yeah. Um, and remember when you have any other coding you're not going to have a pure form. So um, form is sort of like Form is like the very basic, like, if you don't want to put energy into a task, you'll give a form response. It's a yeah. butterfly. Why? Because it looks like a butterfly. There's form. no shading. That's just form. So the more pure form responses you have in ratio to the other ones, the more defensive you are, in mm -hmm. theory. And the higher your lambda is going to be. Yeah. So a high lambda is over 0.99. Like Mauricio was saying, people who have a high lambda maybe being really conservative in their responses, insecure, over-controlled, right? Highly defensive. Whereas a low lambda is less than 0.32. These people are going to be over-involved with the stimuli. They're going to have really poor control over their emotions and the way they respond to tests, to the, to the cards. They may have impulsive acting out and they may have difficulty maintaining relationships. Alternatively, because there's always another element that can be going on, a low lambda can also be indicative of achievement focus. Think about people who are really oriented to wanting to do well. They're going to look for a lot of details. They're going to look at a lot of how to interconnect a lot of the pieces. So there's always going to be two elements in how you interpret these, these scores, okay? Does that make sense to everyone so far? All right, EB, big EB, is really, really important. Everyone hopefully is, is familiar with the experience balance, which is what EB stands for, okay? There must be a two-point difference in the ratio in order for you to interpret it, all right? So when there's a high, a high, a high is considered a four-point difference. So I always get these confused, boop, extra whatever. So introversive, okay? They're very concerned with their inner experience, cautious, deliberate, they internalize, and they exert greater control over their feelings, okay? Common diagnoses, uh, depression, dependent personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, and obsessive compulsive. They're extra tensive, uh, has external interactions to satisfy needs. They're intuitive, feelings oriented, spontaneous, assertive, they act before they think. Okay, so common diagnostic criteria that are usually met are histrionic personality disorders, people in a manic episode like we were talking about before, and people with schizophrenia. Okay, ambitant is when there isn't a two point difference that's going on. And these people lack a clearly defined coping style, okay? So they're more flexible, but they're also more vulnerable to inter and interpersonal problems. Their behavior can be really unpredictable because they really lack that well-defined coping style, whether it's intratensive or extroversive. It's very common for adolescents. Very. Okay, everyone with me so far? Big EA, experience actual. The normal range for big EA is 6 to 10, okay? And basically how we think about EA is it's our storehouse of experiences. It's what we draw from, okay? So it's really looking, if you look at, do you have the equation for big EA? Okay, so it's looking at human movement, <coughs> which is really thought to be reflective of our ability to organize our inner lives. That's what human movement's kind of pulling for. And then also, the weight sum of color, okay? And that's the extent to which emotions are available in our experience, all right? So a high EA, meaning 
over 10 or the higher end towards 10 have a really adaptive capacity <clears throat> and they're really likely to pursue their, their aims and objectives. A low EA on the other hand can be really disturbed or rigid and they have really low or limited coping resources. Okay. I know it's a lot of normal ranges, but it's really important to just kind of really know what a low versus high looks like. The normal range is 6 to 10. Is it important that we know um, what goes into the equations for creating these? Yes. Especially the core section. The core section is kind of the most fundamental element of the structural summary so I would be aware and I would be aware too of kind of what human movement versus color are meant to pull for. Color is always associated with emotions, right? Okay, so little EB, experience base, all right? Where, oh, that's hidden behind the thing. So basically, it's looking at the ratio between non-human movement and shading and achromatic color. So the experience base measures distress and unmet emotional needs. Okay, so if you have a lot of non-human movement, it's really reflective of distressing ideational thoughts. All right, it's all about worry and withdrawal. Okay, whereas shade and color are more reflective of the effective experiences that we have. So it's usually reflective of pain, but you're unsure of the source of it and you ruminate. Now within the shade color component, you have C, V, T, and Y. And each of those elements reflect an, an, an individual compartment of having unmet emotional needs. Okay? So some T texture reflects a need for closeness. Alright? It kind of makes sense. We're looking at tactile, something soft or furry. We do you know what I mean? Like you're gonna need to rely on all these kind of idiosyncratic ways to remember this stuff. I'm helping you out. Um, in general you want one texture? Yes. And that one is expected. If you don't have one it's a concern. Okay? Yeah, if you if you have zero T's, it, it, it sort of tends to indicate that people like not only have like they, they they have a lot of unmet needs, but they're really not seeking it. So it's like we're not, not able to acknowledge. <laughs> so it'd be more like diagnostically on the like the schizoid type range, whereas mm -hmm. a lot of like a lot of T's, and by a lot I mean two or more, it'd be like they have a lot of unmet needs but they're also clingy and needy mm -hmm. in, in their personality. So some why I'm going to jump to. Really pulls for helplessness. So you can expect one or two, but three to four some why responses or why responses is a concern. Okay, three to four is where you start to worry. Anything exceeding four is, is an alert signal, okay? for helplessness. V is self-critical thoughts. If you even have one V, you already have a concern. All right? One is a problem. And some C prime, some C prime is the extent to which you're suppressing painful feelings. Okay? And you if you have any more than 3 C prime responses, it's a concern. So there's a little bit of range. You want one T. You want a textural response. You don't want any Vs at all. But you can have one or two Cs and Ys. Okay? Does everyone get that? It's, imp it's important to note that these, uh, these interpretations and these things are um, are not just like random, but rather they're they're inter empirically derived. Yes. Like they looked at what people what what type of things people with a certain character style would answer, or problems would answer, and they noticed oh there's a clustering of like high T's in this person in this type of people. So a lot of times they we can make sense of them sort of like with the, the furry fuzzy thing, mm -hmm. but the way they're derived are just empirical. 
Yeah. Okay. Then we have ES. Okay. Experienced stimulation. So this is really looking at the total experience distress that the person has. So the normal range is a 5 to 11. Okay. But we really want a lower score. We don't want the person to be experiencing stress. Now, the thing that's important with the ES is that we want to look at the relationship between EA and ES, okay? Now, if EA is greater than ES, meaning their experience actual, their, their storehouse of experience is greater than the stress that they're currently experiencing, then they have the ability to cope. They have coping skills in place that surpass the stress that they're having. So that's okay. However, if the current stress that they're experiencing is greater than their storehouse of experiences that they have to draw from, then they're in trouble. It's basically saying they don't have the resources, they don't have the experience, they don't have the ability to cope effectively with the distress that they're experiencing. Does that make sense? Okay. So what happens with adjusted ES is that basically adjusted ES is removing situational stress from ES. And it's solely looking at the more chronic stresses that people experience. So state versus trait kind of idea. Okay? A similar thing here with D. All right. The D score measures your ability to tolerate stress. Okay, so it's kind of like your available resources versus the disorganizing events that are beyond your control. So D equals zero is normal range. This person is free from anxiety, tension, irritability. They can manage stressful events. They're doing okay. Zero is normal. D, when D equals negative one, we talk about having wiggle room, okay? But negative scores generally su suggest insufficient coping abilities. All right, so negative one, we, we've still got the capacity to intervene and really assist a person. But low D scores really reflect someone who's overwhelmed. They're unable to deal with complex or ambiguous situations. They're really easily distracted and impulsive. So if you have a D equals minus two, that's suddenly very significant, okay? Whereas D1, they're on the cusp. D equals negative one, rather. Okay, and then adjusted D again removes situational factors and it reflects your usual ability to cope with stress, okay? So as we said before, and a score of negative one on the adjusted D suggests that you have trouble with new situations, like you, you have a bit of a reaction to change and you're a bit better in routine or predictable environments. But if, you're, if you have an adjusted D score of negative two or negative three, you're in a continuous state of overload. You're screwed, you're overwhelmed, you're in trouble, okay? How does everyone feel about the core section? Normal ranges, what's going on, what each piece means. Okay. And there's the ranges. Okay, so then we... Oh. Sorry, guys. So then we move on to the effect box. Okay. Slightly smaller, that's good. I didn't have to talk as much. So what we're looking at here is the form color ratio at the top, FCCF plus C, okay? So it measures the degree of control that a person has over their impulses or emotions, okay? We generally want FC to be higher because when FC is higher, when they rely more on form than color, they're able to regulate their emotional experience and their affect a lot more purposefully, okay? However, if there's no color at all, meaning the right-hand side of that ratio is zero, it really reflects that the person is really rigid and cold. They really internalize their affective experience and they have really weak interpersonal relationships. You do want color. Okay, 
So, however, so oh, hold on. So a really important thing to note on the right side of the ratio is CF plus C is zero to 0.5 you're really going to worry about suicide. And you're going to question suicidal behavior. Okay? So you want this to be greater than 0.5. Okay. However, when the right-hand side of that ratio is higher than the left, you're going to have an impulsive or aggressive person. Okay? They have really limited cognitive control. And then within that ratio, if CF, is really pulling for the impaired impulse control. Okay, so if CF is higher, they have impaired co impulse control, but they're still able to regulate to an extent because that form is there. Okay, they have some regulatory capacity. However, if C is higher than CF, emotions dominate over cognitions. They're really impulsive and potentially violent. Okay, so you don't really expect any pure color responses in an adult protocol or an adult response set. Okay? All right. So, POC responses. We just said we don't expect any in an adult, but POC is really looking for, it's really pulling for little regard for adaptiveness of their expressions. People are just really emotionally labile. Okay? They reflect their or express their emotions in a really impulsive manner. Okay, um, highly suggestible and really sensitive. So like we were talking about before, pure C is probably gonna be a lot more dominant in a child or an adolescent protocol versus an adult, just because developmentally where people are. Okay, then we have some C prime versus the weight of some C. So this measures su suppression and constraint of emotion. So you want the weight sum C, the right side of the ratio, to be higher or at least equal to the sum C prime. You never want it to be less than sum C prime. If sum C prime is higher, the left side is higher, then the person is really inhibiting the release of their emotions more than we would want them to or expect them to. And they have the capacity to be really burdened by irritating feelings. And then we have the AFR, which is the effective ratio. Uh, a normal range for this is 0.63 to 0.75, okay? And it's looking at the comparison of the number of responses for cards one through seven versus eight through 10, okay? The predominantly chromatic, achromatic cards versus the color ones. Um, so if you have a really high effective ratio, meaning exceeding 0.75, um, this person is really attracted and receptive to emotional inputs. So they tend to be provocative, they tend to seek out stimulation, but they might not respond to it. Okay, versus a low, a low L, oh, sorry, take me back, sorry. So you want to consider the, the effective ratio in conjunction with the lambda. So if you have a high effective ratio and a high lambda, that person is really provocative. Okay? They're going to seek out stimulation, but they may not always respond to it. If you have a high effective ratio and a low lambda, they respond to everything emotionally. Does that make sense? Sorry that I messed it up. Okay. If you have a low effective ratio, meaning under 0.63, then this person tends to withdraw from their emotions, okay? They are overly avoidant, and they're exerting an extreme amount of control over their effective responses. Sorry, under what? Sorry? Under, under 0.63. 0.63. Remember, the, re the normal range is 0.63 to 0.75 for the effective ratio. So, if you have a low effective ratio, and a high lambda, this person is extremely guarded. I have in my notes, i.e., they're a sociopath. <laughs> okay? If you have a low effective ratio and a low lambda, then the person responds effectively. Their first response is to have an effective um, reaction, but they try to cover it up. Okay? 
but they're not able to, to maintain a separation from others as, of, as effectively if they had a high lambda. And the connection between the effective ratio and the lambda is really important. So if I didn't explain it very well, it's a bit clearer in my notes so that are on Moodle, so have a look at those. So then spaces. Okay, white space. They recommend that it's a measure of anger and oppositional tendencies, but now there's a bit of debate as to the extent to which that's the case, but for the sake of your comprehensive exams, consider it that. Okay? So the normal range for white space responses is one to three. Okay? That's healthy, assertive behavior. All right? If you have more than three space responses, it stops being healthy and it starts being a concern. If all, if all space responses are in cards one to two, then it means that the person isn't well prepared for the test, okay? They're really resistant. Think about they're the initial parts of the test, they're the initial cards, and they're being really aggressive in how they're handling those first two cards. That makes sense, right? That they would be resistant to the test. As you start to understand each of the pieces of the structural summary, you're able to, I think, make more logical conclusions about what things mean. Okay? All right. So, then we're looking at the blends to the number of responses ratio. And this is called the complexity index. Okay? So the normal range, you want at least one blend. Okay? And like Mauricio talked about before, it's common to have 25% of your responses be blends. So if you have more than 25% of your responses as blends, you either have someone of higher intelligence and as a result cognitive complexity, or they're overly complicated. Okay? Uh, something else about the blends is yep. that... Um, I'm sorry if I... No, 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 come off. on in. Is... Um, Typically, you want like you know twenty five percent of them or so. Um, less than that means like maybe they're not as engaged with their emotions or they don't think about them. Or they're neurotic. Or they're neurotic. Um, but generally, um, what you need to focus on there is the shading blends. So shading blends would be blends that involve shading determinants such as vista or texture, texture why? or um, diffuse shading. Why? And uh, those tend to indicate like not only a lot of complexity in the emotions, but a lot of like depressive symptoms, depressive symptoms and, and more generally just like, um, like a lot of complexity dealing with negative or dysphoric emotions. So like sort of more neurotic, more um, depressed. So you really want to be conscious if any of the blends are shading blends. Any shading blends are a concern and possibly meaningful interpretation, okay? If you have more than 25% of blends significantly, it can also represent sensory overload. So people with schizophrenia, all right, tend to have more than 25% of blends. And it represent, the more blends you have, the, it kind of reflects a perceptual disorganization, okay? Then we move on to CP, which is color projection, which we talked about before. It's very, very unusual. Um, one response indicates that the person is denying the presence of an irritating or unpleasant emotion by substituting an inappropriately positive emotion into the situation. That makes sense. You're showing me a black blood and I'm telling you that it's pink. Okay? One is unusual, but when you think about substituting color for achromatic on a really basic, like kind of psychology of color thing, you can really understand why that, what it's pulling for. Black or dark has the capacity to draw for more distressing or upsetting feelings, and then you're suppressing the tendency to want to go there by going, oh look, it's pretty and it's pink or it's purple, and it makes me happy. Okay. So that's the affect box. The interpersonal box. All right. Cooperative and aggressive movements. So the absence of any cooperative or aggressive special scores tends to indicate that a person is really aloof 
and very uncomfortable in social situations. You expect to have cooperative and aggressive scores. In terms of the ranges, if you have more than two cooperative scores, the person is going to be cooperative, shocker, trustworthy, and really easy to be around. However, if you have plus two aggressive scores, a person is going to be really forceful and aggressive in their interactions with others, okay, and potentially quite hostile. When you have three or more aggressive uh, special scores, it's a concern. But one aggressive score is adaptive, okay? So one's adaptive, two's like, oh, okay, they may be a little bit forceful, three, concern. It's a really small range that they're operating in. Um, if you have a, an equal or a balanced number of cooperative to aggressive um, special scores, the person is passive aggressive. Okay. Then you have the good human representation versus poor human representation ratio. Alright? This is really straightforward. Good human representations represent positive interpersonal relationships, whereas poor human representations represent negative interpersonal relationships. That's a fairly, that's the most straightforward way that I can explain that. And like expectations for the, for how like you're what they expect perceive. to interact with other people. So okay. like if they have a lot of good ones, they expect positive things from people. If they have a lot of bad ones, they don't. Yes. Food. <laughs> okay. In an adult protocol, you do not expect any food content scores. Okay? You don't want any. However, it's common to expect one in a child protocol. Excuse me. Okay. So, any kind of food content scores really signal a dependency orientation. Okay? Particularly in children. Anything more than one food content score. Okay, so if you have the presence of food in the raw shark, it really dip, it really signals that that individual relies on others for direction and support, and they're really naive in their expectations expectations of others in interpersonal relationships. Okay, the isolation index, which is oh, right here. Okay. The isolation index includes all non-human, non-social, inanimate and static objects. So it's botany, clouds, geography, nature and landscape. Okay? The isolation index, if it exceeds 0.24, it's a concern. That's the magic number. It's in bold in my notes. Greater than 0.24. Okay? If the isolation index is higher than this, the person is overly withdrawn, they're alienated, and they generally don't have an interest in other people. Okay? Then you have the personal responses, PER. Okay? Personal responses, like I was talking about before, are a need to justify your answers, why you're giving the responses you are, and it's usually reflective of insecurity and defensiveness. All right, and then human content. Higher scores are more desirable because they reflect an interest in other people. So if you have less than three human content scores, it's a concern. Okay, again, three is, three is the magic number. And then you have, where am I? The active-passive ratio, okay? And it's a measure of behavioral activity. So, you usually want active to be higher than or greater than passive. Or active to equal passive to an extent. But you don't want passive to be greater than active. That's pretty self-explanatory, right? So that's in the personal. Am I going too fast? Is everyone kind of... Okay. It's just so much raw shock. How did Dr. Michaels do this so quickly? Okay. Ideation. So, here's...
here the active to passive ratio again it's called the flexibility of thinking index okay so like we were talking about if a equals p it's a signal of possible ambivalence all right If A is less than P, meaning passive is greater, it reflects helplessness, that the person is prone to retreat, they're really susceptible to depressive symptoms, okay, and they look to the outside world for gratification. All right? Human active to human passive, MA, the MP, all right? If MP, human movement passive, is one point higher than human movement active, the person tends to substitute fantasy for reality in really stressful situations. That's an important one, okay? It really reflects an avoidance of responsibility and decision making. So that's if active passive is one point higher than, act, than I mean, if human movement passive is one point higher than human movement active. Talking in all of these codes is really difficult. Then we have this one, 2AB plus art plus anthropology, okay? That's the intellectualization index. So when you have someone where the index is a 4 to 6, this person is really prone to intellectualize their feelings, okay? If the score is greater than 6, intellectualization is a major emotional defense mechanism. So greater than six is where it becomes an mal a maladaptive coping resource, okay? So some six and wait some six, okay? If it's greater than six, it signals the presence of a thought disorder. It usually you should uh, go back and look at the quality of the responses to see if you have any trends in, in the actual responses. Yeah. Okay, where's my mediation? Okay. I don't cover all of the mediation, so... But the key ones in mediation are, that I thought anyway, uh, X plus percent and X minus percent, okay? X plus is conventional form and X minus is distorted form, okay? So with conventional form, it measures the degree to which people perceive things in a conventional and realistic way. So if their percentage on X plus is greater than 90, then they're overly conventional, okay? They sacrifice individuality and they can be quite inflexible and rigid. But if it's under 70%, they're committed to individuality and they perceive the world in an unusual manner. Okay? An important thing to note with X plus is that 53% is usually a signal, it's the schizophrenic average. So people diagnosed with schizophrenia, the average of their score on X plus percent is 53%. Okay? So over 90, overly conventional, under 70%, overly flexible, 53, signal of schizophrenia, okay? X minus percent is looking at distorted form, okay? The mean, meaning the mean normal range for this is 7%. 7% is normative. 20% is a sign of depression. And 37% is again indicative of schizophrenia and reflects a distorted view of reality. Okay? So they're really important percentage ranges to understand. S minus. That's minus. S minus. Oh, I don't have notes for S minus. Um, do you want um, to do the rest of those? I, I mean, you're doing a great job. But S minus, I think, is also really important. S minus, um, and. Um, is different than S, and S minus is the number of uh, a number of responses that include white space that also are um, sort of distorted, and that has to do with um, let, me, let me make sure it's right. Um, S minus means that like it might be anger out of context. So if it's that, it's actually like uh, makes sense because S is anger, S minus it's like it's out of context, but also it's um, 
it's like they're overloaded and they're distorting reality. They're very defensive and oppositionality. So more than anger, it's just like this distortion, defensiveness, and oppositionality. Uh, the mean is um, oh, plus 0.25. But really, it means that if you have any of those, there should be blinking lights somewhere around there. The other thing is you should expect XA and WDA percent to be about equal. Um, they tend to be. I don't think I've ever seen them not be. So um, information processing. Um, has to do with um, you know how people are processing information and motivation. So uh, if you remember the uh, the uh, organizational activity is sort of the energy they put into putting pulling things together, and that's um, sort of like a lot of this has to do with with that. So ZF is um, you know how much energy they put into the test, how much. Um, um, Right. Uh, it's the number. It's the frequency of Z responses. How many of the, how many responses are there with a Z score? Um, oh, sorry. Hmm? And so a high ZF is greater than thirteen, and that really looks at really high drive and initiative, a lot of intellectual striving. Okay. Whereas a, a low ZF is less than nine, and that can be depressive features, um, really not a lot of effort being put in uh, or, li or limited cognitive ability. Okay. So that's ranges. Hmm. And uh, related to that is uh, ZD. I don't, I forgot, I don't know why there's no formula for it. But usually you say like, what is the average, if you sum up all the different Z scores for all the different ones there, um, there's the actual one, like you go by and like add everything, but there's also, based on ZF, there's an estimated like value for that, so that's ZS, and ZD is the difference between Z, the actual like num if you add like say one plus three plus six point five, you add all of those, you subtract it from, uh, then you subtract what the estimated one, and ZD is a different score in organizational ability. It's a processing efficiency. Mm -hmm. It can be positive or negative depending on whether they had more or less, like like summation of Z's than what would be expected. And if it's greater than plus three, they are over incorporators. That means they have an inefficient use of energy. They're looking at the details too much. They don't really know how to cut corners because they're focusing a lot on like integrating. They're putting a lot of energy, more than they need to. Uh, they, have, they might have too many things on their plate. Uh, sounds like me. Um, you know, uh, in children, it can be a sign of abuse. If ZD is less than negative three, they are an under-incorporator. That means they also have um, an inefficient use of energy, but in the other direction. They might be careless and unsystematic. They're not processing fully. They don't spend the time looking at things very carefully. They tend to be scattered, they can't focus, and they may be impulsive. Um, usually, that's, uh, you can associate that with people with ADHD. Um, and just a, a general lack of focus. And then anything that is between mi minus three and three, you can consider like to be like, oh, generally normal. Um, so uh, W to D to DD are three numbers, the number of whole to detail to unusual detail. And that is called also the economy index. Um, how economical and orderly they process information. Um, usually, um, if whole is bigger than D, uh, the person is striving to organize perceptions globally in ambiguous situations. They're putting a lot of energy into things. Um, if the W to D ratio is greater than 1 to 3, so if you have more than three times as many Ds as Ws, um, no, the other way around. Um, yeah, if they have more Ds than Ws, they're actually choosing an easier path. Uh, when faced with ambiguity, they look for the obvious, the concrete, the practical. They tend to be cautious and conservative. Mm -hmm. If DD is greater than 10% compared to the other two, um, they might be missing the obvious. They might be focusing on the details. Uh, they tend to miss the big picture and be obsessive. And it's also a form of avoidance. You know, you're focusing on the details. It's like focusing on the trees in, instead of the forest. Mm -hmm. Um, 
they might get caught in the details. Um, a typical, like if you look at the different norms, you'd look for something like 8 to 13 to 2. I've never seen some, I've never seen a protocol where it actually goes based on what I'd expect, so I don't know what that means. Another one that's really important is W to M. That's what we call the aspirational ratio. You want it to be, so M, W is um, sort of the goals, like achievement, what they want to do, like, um, you know, I want to go to college and go to grad school, and then M is um, sort of the, like, the horsepower or the motivation that they have. So they're related, right? If you have high goals, you should also have like a high motivation and like a lot of mm, get it done capabilities. So you're looking at the difference between those here. You usually want the goals to be three times as high as the motivations. Not to say that you know you want more than is capable. That's just the ratio that is found when it's normal. If it's less than 2.1. The goals might be uh, lower than their capabilities, and that, when it's a very big difference, it's really important because uh, it might be somebody that you know has a lot of uh, huge aspirations and they don't have the horsepower to do it. Um, so it has to do with um, unrealistic goals. If it's like 3.5, greater than 3.1, um, so you want to just look at the ratio. Usually, if it's like two to three, four, uh, two to two and a half. Um, times the other, then they're concerned. Um, DQ plus is the number of um, just the number of plus responses. That represents the ability to synthesize perceptions, right? Because you're having two objects that are in interrelation. Um, so it's related to higher intelligence. You want to compare it with uh, the vague responses because it's less mature and difficulty processing. Like they can't figure out an app perception. So they're like, oh, I'm going to give something vague because I can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. So you want to compare this. You want, uh, you want more, um, more synthesized responses than vague responses. You'd expect about two vague responses. Um, you'd expect about five to eight um, synthesized responses. Of course, you ha when we say like how many responses you would want, um, you should always look at, well, does that make sense based on like the number of responses? All right, we'll move on quickly because I know we're almost out of time. Um, so um, 3R plus 2 divided by R, so that's a percentage of like sort of reflections and pairs. That's the egocentricity index. It's how much they focus on themselves. It's related to self-esteem. You want it to be between 0.3 and 0.4, so 30 to 40% of the responses. Um, that's good. If it's greater than 0.4, they might be um, kind of egotistical uh, over the concerns for themselves. Um, and um, yeah, and then you have to look at anyway, That's good enough. Morbid responses are, um, have to do with feeling damaged. Um, <coughs> the number of reflections has to do with like um, how they like their ability to like look into themselves. It's um, the mean is like 0.11, probably not. So you, you don't really expect many of those. Um, FD, as we I think we mentioned before, is introspection. Um, you know, you want some of them because it's an ability to look inwards and be insightful about one's behavior, but not too many because that means that it, it like might be painful introspection. They're like focusing in on themselves, being very harsh on themselves. Anatomy and x-ray, those are um, very, very uncommon. They usually indicate somatic symptoms. They indicate concerns about their body. Like oftentimes, like if people are like, you know, we're teased because of the way they look, um, that, that'll be very high. So it can be like both are like ruminating about your self-image, okay? But it can also be if people have um, body or physical problems mm -hmm. as well. So it can be both um, perceptual or imagined and experienced, okay? So if someone has a lot of health concerns, yeah. you're, going, you're going to expect that to be quite high. And I wish we, we had more time to go into this a little bit more in terms of 
you're probably going to have a question on the comps that is used to compare some of this with like the MMPI. So you'd be like, oh, this, this is like this would be correlated with like scale three, for instance. Yeah. Um, this would be correlated maybe with scale S. Um, and this, I don't think it's all that well validated, but it is um, sort of like like object relations, like how um, you want more <coughs> pure humans than other types of human responses. And do you have anything else to say about that one? Um, yeah. So this is like it really reflects interpersonal interest. So if it's weighted to this side, which is really what we want, then you have more realistic ideas. Um, okay, like it's, it's the human, like whole human responses. So if it's weighted more to this side, which is the mythical human, human detail or mythical human like detail, then people have unreali unrealistic or overly fantasized expectations of interactions, okay? Um, Whereas this is more realistic. If you have more human detail or mythical human detail parts, you have people who, that aren't able to really like integrate whole experiences of a person. Okay? So they're going to focus more on components and not be able to like hold that good like limitations, positives, like the more well-rounded idea of who a person is. Um, another thing to note, if you have more than three morbid responses, it's a concern, okay? Uh, and there was another one. You and like Marissa was saying, you really don't expect any, if, like any reflection responses, and any more than one can indicate potentially narcissistic features. Right. Um, it's important to note that what we're saying about like the. Um, oh. Awesome. Um, about like the values, those are for healthy normal adults. Yeah. Um, you would want to look, if it's children, you definitely want to look at the norms which are in the book. You probably don't have to know them, you have to know the norms for healthy adults. Yes. Um, <coughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, so just what Mauricio said, you're not going to be expected to know the ranges for children. Um, there, the key parts I would know is that you expect one food with children, you expect like a, a texture response with children, but you don't with adults, mm -hmm. okay? But really all of the numerical ranges that you need to know, the ones we've been talking about, they're, they're the only ones that you need to know. Okay, so and there's one more, we're done with the sort of the interpretation, except for there's also the constellations, which you're probably also familiar with. Um, we, uh, we blocked out the name of it because um, it's a good exercise to be able to see, well, I mean, we've already talked about what all of these findings would mean. So it's um, a good way to study would be to look at this and, I mean, we don't have time to go over each of them, uh, but just saying like, okay, what, what makes sense in terms of what you know about the constellations, about, you know, color shading blends, we've <laughs> talked about those. Oh, goodness. Highly dysphoric. Morbid. Morbid content greater than three. We just said more than three is a concern. Okay. Um, space responses more than three. That's a concern. All right. Pure human responses less than two. That's a concern. Not that much interest in people. Okay. Less than seventeen responses. Seventeen or twenty-seven is a normal range for responses. Okay, so that it seems like they're really highly defensive, don't have a lot of interest in other people, lots of morbid content, okay, um, color shading blends. So very dysphoric, a lot of anger, um, not very appropriate use of form, so there like might be some pers like problems in thinking. ES is greater than EA, okay? So the distress that they're experiencing is greater than the storehouse of, ex of, of resources that they have to cope with. So rather than try to like, and we set it up like this because rather than try to just kind of memorize the things of each constellations, if you really understand the elements of the structural summary, you don't need to memorize the constellations because you can look and go, oh, okay, I understand what each of the like what a lot of these key aspects mean. I can make a logical deduction about which constellation this is. Anyone has a guess on what what this one would be? Suicide. Right. So this is the S constellation or suicide potential. Um. Okay. Well, wait. Oh, it's four o'clock. Yeah. So um, 
essentially we are going to go over these, really but you can do that, I guess, on your own, and then we're going to go over examples, but, um, but sorry, guys. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> But I would really do that with the constellations. Like I would really test myself in that way where you kind of like are able to identify key pieces because it also is another indirect way of reinforcing elements of the structural summary. Like the trick is to learn it in as many different directions and ways as you can because then it becomes a lot more resolute. You can't wrote learn this. No. Um, or I mean if you, you did it, but it, it'd be, it was just so, so hard. Yeah. You, there'd be a lot to know. So, um, over incorporator. Right. So, just in general, things that we, we don't have time to do, but uh, you should think about thinking about how the Rorschach would relate to the MMPI. Um, you know, what scales you would, what things you would expect to vary together. Test yourselves with the constellations. In the back of the workbook, there are a lot of examples on coding. Code they are in order of difficulty. Make sure that you can. Uh, do most of the ones fairly accurately of the sort of a moderate level of difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, and also in terms of interpretation. If you can find, like, trade with each other, find somebody that can give you a structural summary and uh, try to see if you can interpret it um, and see if it makes sense. So that's it. That's, um, the, end that's the end. Of the sessions. Um, good luck with comps. Thank you. Thank you. Pace yourself. And you'll be okay. Just don't binge. Just, just don't binge study three days before. Like pace yourself. Use the time that you have from now until the exam to just read, reread. Okay, guys. But good luck. Yeah, good luck. Thank you. Thank you.